Um, this is Kali Akuno. I'm uh, here with uh, uh, Erikin uh, Iboiga from, I hope I pronounced your name uh, uh, correctly. It is or close. S yes, it is Erjan Iboga. Erjan I. Erjan Iboga. Iboga, okay. Yes. Um, so you have to forgive me, my, my uh, Los Angeles uh, uh, accent and bad uh, American education. Um, no problem. Uh, but it's a pleasure to have you here. Uh, good seeing you again. Uh, I know our paths have crossed a couple of times. Um, and to just share uh, a bit with us today about the struggle uh, in Rojava, which we've been describing to our membership, uh, is one of the most dynamic and important uh, democratic struggles taking place in the world right now, uh, and that we have a lot to learn uh, from it. Uh, many of us uh, in our, our leadership circle here have been studying uh, uh, the revolution for years now as it's, as it's grown and progressed, uh, and now it's facing some new challenges, which hopefully we'll, we'll get into. Uh, so we wanted to just kind of open it up so more people uh, can get exposed, both in the United States as to what's happening in, in Rojava, but more particularly for us, our membership uh, could have some direct contact and learn some things. Uh, one of the things that, as, as I've shared with you, that we've always uh, found uh, interesting uh, is the parallel between in some of our thinking uh, between what, what was developed as the Jackson Cush Plan uh, and where the, the Roosevelt Revolution and, and the democratic confederalism, the feminization of politics, uh, the, the ecological uh, uh, centering of the project, uh, uh, the development of the solidarity economy, uh, the, just the parallels in terms of what we're trying to do, uh, albeit on a smaller scale, but I think uh, very much connected. And we've been looking at kind of the deeper threads of how our different movements even got to this point uh, somewhat independent of each other. Uh, we think it has a lot to do with just the dynamics of the global system uh, right now and what we've all learned uh, from the experiences of the past, I would say really 40 years uh, with some of the failed uh, uh, experiments of the previous generation, the previous century, and how we're continuing to try to learn from those lessons uh, and move forward. So we wanted to open it up today uh, for you to just give us a presentation um, and for us to ask some questions and answers a little bit later on uh, so we can get a deeper understanding of the project there. Uh, and as I was mentioning to you earlier and for everybody here, um, definitely maybe at some point if you could just weave in uh, what's happening in uh, Afrin right now uh, and the threat of uh, the invasion from the Turkish state and, and some of its uh, allies, which uh, many of us uh, think is very important. Even a few of my comrades have described what's going on as like the Stalingrad of, of our time of the 21st century. I do think it's becoming that uh, important and central. And I think as, as we learn more and more about the work that's going on there, uh, hopefully others beyond just this room will we'll see the importance of it and, and uh, start figuring out how to be in more practical solidarity with uh, uh, the struggle there and the work that's going on. So I'll, I'll stop there and, and turn it over to you. Okay. Um, Kali and all the friends there, thank you for asking me to do this speech, to have a contribution and a discussion with you on what's going on in Rojava and beyond it. Um, first, I would like to do a basic introduction to the Kurds. Um, Rojava is, uh, let's say, the Syrian part of Kurdistan, land where the Kurds live. And, but it has a, a, let's say, background and history, how this revolution has happened or is undergoing. Um, the Kurds live in the Middle East. Uh, their land has been divided after the First World War between four states, between four uh, nation states. The Kurds belong to the native people. They live along the two mountain ranges mainly. And uh, since the establishment of the states, the Kurds are oppressed in these four states 
they are neglected, uh, confronted with massacres, even genocides, continuously assimilation, economic exploitation, and so on. It's a kind of the biggest international colony in Middle East, maybe. Um, in the 60s, resistance started against the status um, in all parts of Kurdistan and the four parts. The four parts are in the states of Turkey, uh, Iran, Iraq, and Syria. Syria is the smallest part. Uh, the biggest part is within the Turkish states. Uh, they live around 20 million. And then the other parts together also 20 million. I am from the Turkish part, which we call North Kurdistan. In the 70s, uh, I mean, in North Kurdistan, um, uh, many new groups came up. Um, one of them was the Kurdistan Workers' Party PKK, the most famous one and the biggest one. Um, uh, there were many, but PKK um, was, let's say, more militant, more proletarian, and they um, prepared from the very beginning on an armed struggle. And in '84, they started it against uh, the military coup from 1980, which brought actually uh, fascism to North Kurdistan and all over Turkey. So um, PKK has been founded up. And the roots go to the uh, 68 student movement. It uh, has been formed as a Marxist-Leninist organization, and it fought long time for a united socialist um, uh, Kurdistan, independent Kurdistan or Kurdish state. This was a big aim. Um, it managed to become a mass movement around 92. Uh, millions of people start to support it. Um, the headquarter, political headquarter, was in Syria and Lebanon. The Syrian state gave a kind of space, uh, not a direct support, because of their uh, contradiction with Turkey. PKK used it, and they also um, organized many people in Rojava, many Kurds. And they also joined the struggle in North Kurdistan, especially the guerrilla resistance. In the 90s, the state uh, responded with terrorism, state terrorism. They destroyed 4,000 villages. Three million people have been displaced. Uh, an important part came to Europe. Um, uh, there was a very strong repression. and. Uh, has been supported by the NATO states, especially by the USA and uh, Germany. They actively supported the Turkish state in oppressing uh, the PKK, but in general the Kurds, because uh, they attacked the big landscape. Anyway, in 1999, um, there was an international plot against uh, the Kurdish uh, freedom movement. We say in, more in general Kurdish freedom movement, which includes also the structures now in Rojava. And uh, Öcalan, the leader, Abdullah Öcalan, the leader, has been kidnapped. And this plot has been coordinated by the CIA. And he has been handed over to Turkey. Since then, he is in prison. Um, so the USA, they had an approach like uh, good Kurds and bad Kurds. The good Kurds were the two big parties in Iraqi Kurdistan. Uh, or South Kurdistan. Um, they sub have been supported after 91, the first Gulf War or second Gulf War. Um, so there was kind of autonomy, but it was a conservative structure or an authoritarian. It was a kind of mini state. And they were very close to the US government. Um, but uh, PKK represented the left, the so-called bad Kurds, but they were leftist movement, an independent movement, this is important, a uh, movement which could not be um, taken over uh, by any power, uh, regional or international. So uh, after the plot, the war stopped, because Erdogan said we should stop the war and discuss basically 
our who strategy, our ideology, our who approach, everything new. There were some discussions in the 90s already, which were not on focusing on an own state anymore, and there was the the seek for uh, other solutions, more uh, and the democratization of the movements. Um, so Erdogan became the initiator from the prison. Um, and this was also the time uh, after 99 where with the stop of the war there was more political space, less repression and uh, the legal Kurdish party, they uh, won several uh, municipalities in North Kurdistan. Um, uh, so there was a kind of space where some things could be developed and experimented. Uh, the civil society became stronger after 99. Uh, anyway, so the, in that time, um, there was a lot of reading and discussion. Uh, we read books from many people and articles. Among them were Murray Bookchin, uh, Emmanuel Wallerstein, uh, Brodel, and Foucault, to mention only some names. So. Um, Bookchin was one of the many, but he was not the only one. Uh, he came, especially in the first years, it was very important uh, with this municipalist approach. Uh, it fit to what the Kurdish freedom movement was also uh, seeking. We looked uh, to the experiences and faults and problems of the former revolutions, the Spanish Revolution, USSR, China, Cuba, and so on to different revolutionary movements. We looked uh, also to the new political movements, the leftist libertarian movements, uh, especially the Zapatistas, of course. We looked uh, to the um, uh, glo global, <laughs> critical globalization movement and so on. And there was of also a self-critical view of the experience of the 80s and 90s, its concept and the whole structures, uh, which uh, attached millions of people, Kurds, but not uh, yet the big majority. Still, too many people, too many Kurds, they stood in distance to the movement. The movement was not able to include the most of them. Um, in this year's the discussion focused on a more civil strategy, on a political strategy, and how to organize the society. And in 2005, um, the Öcalan declared um, a new concept as a result of all these discussions. It has been called democratic confederalism. Uh, it has a paradigm with three pillars. We speak about the uh, a democratic, ecological, and uh, gender-liberated society. Uh, these three pillars became and are very crucial for us, for the Kurdish freedom movement and the revolution in Rojava. Uh, democracy means a form of direct democracy. It starts on the very ground, uh, in the villages, in the streets. We speak about the communes on the lowest level, Communes, we um, make a relay, uh, how do you say, a connection to the past, not very far past, a past where the societies were more in solidarity, more communal, more sharing before capitalism, um, the democratic side of the society. In, on the uh, next levels, we have the people's assemblies. Uh, this is the practice which exists uh, the last decades, centuries in many, many countries. Like in, with, even in your movement, as I read the GK plan just today. Um, the, the people's assemblies, they are composed not only of the communes, they shall include the most part, the more parts of the societies. I mean the different actors, organizations in the societies, the sectors. Uh, we say that the society is actually a whole. It's diverse, but in the end it's a big organism which uh, must deal with each other, where decisions must taken, 
in a democratic way, in a balanced way, where no one social class or a group um, imposes itself on the others. This is a problem, uh, or that's not the case in a representative democracy which we have all around uh, the world. The second uh, pillar is the women liberation, uh, the gender liberation, but especially the women liberation. For us, it is a main contradiction. So um, we put in the focus the liberation of women, which is a liberation of all of us. Liberation must start with the liberation of women. Uh, because hegemony, hierarchy, it started with patriarchy. Um, patriarchy is dominating our thinking uh, extremely. We must break first, uh, especially with this, not only, but especially with this. Concerning our societies, it's very important, and we see it from the practice of the last years. The third uh, pillar is uh, ecology. Um, we say that life uh, and uh, the whole life, our life must respect the nature of which we are actually the part of. Uh, it is a source of life for us. It's not uh, something to exploit without a uh, limit. Um, that's undergoing, that's why we have a big ecological crisis. Uh, all species uh, in our planet have the life to uh, have the right to live and uh, we defend this and the, especially the economy must change if you want an ecological society a more healthy society the models uh, must change uh, this brings us to anti-capitalism i mean uh, without to be against capitalism uh, it is not possible to have an ecological society from ecological society uh, actually, from all the pillars, we come to a um, to a um, how to say uh, to the um, aim to form also an economy of solidarity, which we call a democratic and communal economy. This is the word we are using. Uh, with this concept of democratic confederalism, we refuse the nation state. We don't want any more nation state. We don't actually want an own. Kurdish states. Uh, we are looking, we say that the liber, liber, liberty of the Kurds is connected to the democracy in the four states of Turkey, Iran, Iraq, and Syria. Uh, you cannot disconnect it from a uh, political system and situation in these four states. Um, so uh, uh, the soul of democratic confederalism. It's a democratic nation. Uh, we um, define nation in a new way. A uh, nation which must be democratic. This is composed of communities and individuals. Uh, I mean, it is not only connected to territory or language. Um, uh, the so uh, the content is very important, uh, and uh, each person can even have two can belong to two different democratic nations. The concept we have for the Kurds, for it means that the Kurds are on the one side part uh, of a democratic nation of Turkey, but they are also part of democratic nation of the Kurds. So links with the other parts of Kurdistan, but uh, also um, new relations with the, let's say, the major Turkish population. Um, so uh, the practical body, how this finds life, uh, is called by us democratic autonomy, um, which can in each state or region uh, difference. So I have used a lot of words uh, democratic confederalism, democratic nation, and democratic autonomy. Anyway, so a little for this uh, uh, to make more uh, understanding the concept. Anyway, uh, before the, the, the Rojava revolution, there was a practice in North Kurdistan. In 2007, uh, the Democratic Society Congress, DTK, has been founded. Democratic Society Congress, an umbrella organization for for all the uh, organizations of the Kurdish Freedom Movement, 
and um, uh, beyond uh, in North Kurdistan. So Hook um, comes together with our the People's Assemblies, which have been founded in the most neighborhoods of North Kurdistan. Um, it's an, it started around 2006 7 There are the social movements, which represent the different sectors of the society, starting with the women, the youth, ecology, economy, health, education, justice, and so on, uh, defense even. Um, the political parties are part of it. Uh, we have a political party, which is part of the Democratic Society Congress. And uh, the NGOs, the different kind of NGOs, can be part of this Democratic Society Congress uh, in North Kurdistan. Over the years, we have always invited even new parties, new groups, new organizations to take part in this new structure. And uh, there was always a effort to give space. Anyway, um, this create this new way of reorganizing society in North Kurdistan and uh, created a new dynamic. The movement became stronger again, especially after the international plot of 99. It became stronger even uh, what was the level in the beginning of the 90s. And more parts of the society started to support and join the new political structures, which became the dominant one or the biggest one in North Kurdistan. There are other parties like the party from Erdogan, the AKP, but um, how do you say the, the Kurdish Freedom Movement has a majority in the most Kurdish provinces of Turkey. So uh, uh, we were in this process, the Turkish state saw this, uh, there were uh, repression against the structures from uh, between 2009 and 12, there was a big wave of repression and since 2015, there's again a very strong repression against the different pol uh, political structures in North Kurdistan. There are uh, thousands of people now uh, in arrest. Uh, I can say 10,000 people are arrested since 2050s. Um, yes, I mean, and then we were just in the process of setting up structures, in, especially in North Kurdistan. Uh, then came the uprising in Syria and the war. Uh, in Rojava, there was a party which uh, is part, let's say, part of the Kurdish freedom movement in general, and which accepted in 2005 Democratic Confederism. This party is PYD, the Democratic Union Party. The PYD is essential for the revolution in Rojava. It started with the PYD. Uh, it was until 2011 and uh, a big repression by the Syrian state, but it continued to work, never gave up. It founded uh, not only typical party structures, they were always afforded to uh, form different kind of committees and commissions. Anyway, when the uh, uprising started in Syria, Piwari decided to form similar structures to North Kurdistan. People's assemblies, different kind of committees and sectors. What was important is that were the language courses and so on. And with other, uh, with all these new social movements, uh, the group organizations, and even two or three other smaller political parties, they founded um, the movement for a democratic society, which is called shortly Tevdem. Have them became the main actor of the revolution. It has been found in 2011, um, just when the revolutionary process started. And 2012, in summer, when the Syrian state became very weak, was shaking, have them took the decision to liberate the cities and regions of Rojava, started on July 19 of 2012. So it was a, they were preparing themselves and they waited actually for the weak point of the Syrian state and then they took over the cities in an unbloody uprising because the Syrian state was so weak and there were no armed conflicts between the Kurds and the Syrian states at that stage. And the Syrian state had an interest not, how do you say, not to, um, to have also a front against the Kurds. 
anyway, this have them um, um, adapt along to the principles of democratic conferism starts to organize a society. They benefited, of course, as I said, from North Kurdistan. And uh, after the liberation of the cities and settlements, the, the space was created to organize the society in a completely new way. The state didn't exist anymore. There was no other political power. Uh, they would ha have not filled it. Others, like the Free Syrian Army or other structures, would have come to there. So they organized uh, everywhere uh, people's assemblies. And then in a second step, the communes came up. The communes have been founded everywhere as a level more on the ground to include more people and the self-organized structures. Here the role of TEVDEM and especially PYD was very crucial. Uh, like they had a certain kind of an avant-garde, but uh, they went to the people and uh, there was a process of convincing people to form their communes, their own committees to organize their life, uh, economic life, social life, actually everything. And um, to mention some committees which these communes have, uh, they are the self-defense, um, which is very important uh, concerning the Syrian context. Health is important. To maintain health care was very crucial. Uh, education, uh, I mentioned the language courses, but now with the liberation, the schools have been, the state schools have been liberated. And economy, to organize the economy is important and organizing society and the peace commissions or let's say reconciliation committees. These are the basic uh, committees in the communes. The communes you must understand like it has each commune has 100, 150, maybe 200 households. So they count households. It's a smaller structure and today there are around 3,800 communes in Rojava and beyond. Now there are also communes, dozens of communes at least, in non-Kurdish areas and the other liberated areas of northern Syria, especially in the last two years. So uh, we have to understand the, uh, how people organize themselves. We have the a vertical way, I mean on the, on the uh, ground the commune, then we have the people's assemblies, uh, which are inclusive, like in North Kurdistan, which include different uh, um, NGOs, unions, different sectors of society, even the non-political, everybody is invited to take part. The non-Kurds, especially the Syriacs, the Arabs, wherever, uh, whoever is living there has been invited to take part. And in the very beginning, it was not, maybe in the most parts, not the majority. It's but over time, with the years, became the big majority uh, in, this, in the society. And this is the vertical way. And we have the horizontal way. I spoke about the sectors, or you can say fields, social fields. Uh, as I said, uh, economy, self-defense, women, youth, ec um, health, justice, diplomacy, and so on. In the beginning there were nine, now we have 14. Anyway, um, so the, com the people in the different committees of the communes and the people's councils um, are formed according to these uh, sectors, the fields. So you have in a people's assembly, let's say 10 committees, but the people of the economy committee, they are also connected to the general economy movement. Uh, each woman actually in a, um, a commune or people's assembly is part of the women movement, more or less. So there's a, a two way of organizing the society and uh, this is a, um, very crucial uh, to the, that the sectors are also a strong social uh, movement or a, a sectoral movement organization. So. Um, um, on the, uh, the communes, they have become over the time more and more important. They become more central elements. 
uh, whatever you want to do, you can do it through your communes, communes, you can bring it to the communes, discuss many things and to bring it to the other structures if you want to initiate something. And uh, the communes are the first address. Uh, after, let's say, two, three years, the Syriacs, the Armenians, the Chaldeans, they are mainly they're Christian mainly, and the Arabs and the Turkmans, uh, they have started also to form communes because they have seen how society can be stronger if in a, a certain area society organizes itself. To include, and the next step in 2014, to include more parts of the society of Rojava and the political process, a new s a structure has been developed by TEVDEM, TEVDEM, the Demo Movement for Democratic Society. Uh, they formed with many other organizations which didn't join have them the democratic self administration uh, in th Russia has three main regions and now they have been called cantons maybe you have heard the canton if you read about Rojava revolution you her, you can hear the uh, read the name canton very often democratic self administration is kind of an upper structure where have them and the many other organizations and parties come together where the big majority of the society is represented. It's not through typical elections, more including everybody in the beginning. And they have uh, discussed the social contract, not the constitution. Uh, the society has discussed it over months and has been approved. Anyway, and then the democratic autonomy has been declared. Democratic autonomy is a concrete form how this structure could be. So, um, anyway, this was the second step, and uh, so it and then it progressed, and the uh, and democratic self administration they um, um, prepared new laws in the different areas because the Syrian laws there were not mostly not democratic, so they uh, developed uh, laws in the missing areas step by step. Um, and uh, let's look to the uh, each sector. Uh, for example, the women movement, which is called there in Rojava Congressar. There, as I said, all women structures are involved. Uh, the women movement takes care that uh, everywhere we have a co-chair system. Wherever there is an organization uh, or an NGO which uh, is part of the revolution, uh, has a co-chair system, a man and a woman. We have a gender quota of at least 40%, 50% is always aimed. The, the defense forces of uh, in Rojava, which are called YPJ, are part of it. Okay. Hang on just a second. Yes. Our uh, screen went a little funny. Give us just a second, okay? Okay. <laughs> Okay, I think it's four, Jeff. Okay. Four. What's going on? Okay. Hello? Yes, I can hear you. Yeah, we're back now. Okay. Okay. So, another program in another room when it just cut you off. Okay. Anyway, so I was speaking about the women's movement. Uh, there are different kinds of defense forces of the women. Right, kind of local security, and when we have the YPJ, which are the Women Defense Units, a military branch, and we have the YPG, more the General uh, People's Defense Units, and even they are part of the women's movement. When the, there's a big congress, the YPJ comes, the military uh, branch, and the different security forces, and they act together. There are peace committees uh, only composed by women if there's uh, any conflict which is about women's rights. 
and they have the right to decide, even if it's, if it's a man. And we have, there are women cooperatives, which come together in the women's economy movement, and they are also part of it. So there are women's houses in each neighborhood. So there are a lot of structures uh, which come together in the women movement. Um, to give an example, the women, they have discussions on each subject. They have just uh, are finishing uh, the first women's village in Rojava, which is called Jinwar. Jinwar is a women a village which will be ready in two months maybe, and there will be there will be living only women, probably around 70, 80. It's a very important project. Uh, if it works, this idea can be spread. Women with different backgrounds will come and live there, and the village has been built by women uh, with ecolo in an ecological way. Uh, it's a project which is now in the last time uh, very known. Um, the education, coming to the next sector, the education, for example, as I said, the language courses were important because they couldn't, the people could speak Kurdish, of course, but they couldn't write and read in Kurdish. It was uh, forbidden. So the own language was forbidden. So the first step, the children in the schools learn Kurdish and the people uh, to read and write. And the second step, the primary schools became complete, mostly or completely in Kurdish for the Kurdish children, not for the Arabs. The Arabs, they continue to be teach in Arabic, but they have also common course and the people learn their language each other the Syriacs have now their special schools the number is not big but it's important that every identity or language uh, has an own um, let's say school or classes a new curriculum completely new based on the concept of democratic confederalism has been written for the schools now there are also Kurdish universities for two years it's historical. There was no Kurdish university in Rojava and North Kurdistan. There is no one. In Iraqi Kurdistan, there is one, but it's in another dialect. So it was a challenge to do it now in Rojava. Anyway, uh, the education, if you speak about the education, you should not look only to the schools and universities. What is uh, also very important are the academies. <laughs> academies are areas small uh, structures or institutions which each social movement organization can set up and there are hundreds of uh, academies today in Rojava you, if you go to a city you will find several and there are people working living there and they are interacting with the communes the people's assemblies with different movements they do studies they do seminars people come join one day, one week seminars, all the activists of the academies go to the communes. There's a strong interaction. The basic idea is to uh, share knowledge as much as possible. It should not be too much in the hands of uh, experts. The healthcare issue was very crucial in the first years. It was a big problem. Now it has become better. And now in Afrin, because of the war, we have a crisis there. But in the last two years, Became better uh, because of the many um, uh, health councils, which you can find in each city or region. They always continuously worked on this issue. So uh, healthcare is either completely free or almost free, uh, at least very cheap. There's there are of course also some private doctors, but they are more expensive. So. Um, what the healthcare now do, uh, there's a one important project, they go to all step by step to the communes and want to share basic healthcare knowledge with the commune. So in each commune, two people learn how to uh, organize healthcare for their own communes and the basic issues. So they get really self-organized, self-empowered. There's important structures. And I said there are um, in the justice, let's come to the justice sector, to the justice system, there are peace commissions in each commune or some communes come together and form one common peace commission. And uh, they exist in Rojava all, already since the 90s. It's not very new. So there's already a long uh, experience. 
and uh, they managed in the year 2016 to solve 80% uh, of the conflicts in the society. Uh, the cases which are not solved, they go to an upper structure uh, called justice platforms. Uh, let's continue. Uh, let's come to economy. Um, coming uh, step by step. I hope it's not too long. Economy, as I said, the aim is to have a democratic and uh, communal economy. Uh, in Rojava, uh, the, how do you say, the private property has not been forbidden or so. Uh, but the state companies, structures, uh, and the oil fields, and the state-owned land has been taken by Tevdem, or let's say, uh, taken uh, to the structures of the revolution. And they are, they are managed by kind of public companies. But in a, there's a big discussion to transform uh, of, the, of these properties, the majority of the properties, to, uh, to the population through cooperatives, step by step. This has started with the land. 5% of the agricultural land in Rojava is now given to, to people if they form a commune, uh, sorry, a cooperative. The, the communes around a certain piece of land, if they come together and form a cooperative for this land, then have them or the Democratic Self Administration give this land to this uh, new cooperative based on a, a, a status which has been discussed for two years. And the idea is uh, to develop the economy of solidarity through these cooperatives. And there are a few hundred cooperatives. They, they are developed step by step. It's not too fast because there is not much experience. There was not experience before. There is not much successful uh, experiences in the world on which we can rely. So step by step, it is developed. Also, uh, now small farmers they have started to form cooperatives, but it's the people must be convinced before they do. Uh, it's the idea to impose it on them is not uh, the correct way, which we have seen from the Soviet U Union, for example. So, but the problem uh, in Rojava, as I said. Uh, First, to know for the background, there, Rojava has been developed by the Syrian state, by the Ba'ath regime, as a big agricultural area. Though uh, it has, there was a production of big amounts of wheat, more than half of Syria. Syrian's wheat has been produced there. 30% uh, of Syria's uh, olives have been produced there. And two-thirds of Syria's cotton. And the textile industry in Syria is strong. So almost all land where it was used in this way, and there was almost no industry. The state didn't allow industry, and it was the poorest region uh, in theory. And many Kurds, they were cheap workers in the big cities of Aleppo and Damascus. Like in North Kurdistan, there's the same. So the people, they go to Istanbul, Ankara, and to work. There are millions who live outside of North Kurdistan. Anyway, so. This centralized economy uh, is a challenge to, to transform it, to develop self-sufficiency, uh, to independency, economic independency. It's very difficult because of huge land which produce uh, wheat, olives or cotton. So now there's a certain success in the diversification of agricultural production. And another big problem is the embargo imposed by Turkey. It's complete, 100% embargo. There is a certain embargo from Iraqi Kurdistan, from South Kurdistan, and also from the Ba'ath regime. Uh, the two, the, uh, Iraqi Kurdistan, the party there which controls the border is a neoliberal conservative party. Uh, I said uh, they were or are the good Kurds for the West and they are against this revolution, the social revolution, they consider it as a threat for them. So uh, the embargo is a big problem because you cannot bring uh, production means. You can bring some food and clothes and so 
some medicine it's possible nobody there's no hunger but but the aim is to develop a dependence anyway and then there's a war of course the war is uh, takes your resources big resources you use it for a uh, lot of income goes to the war because you must always defend consider the attack of islamic state against the uh, region of kobani three four years ago so uh, one year there was a big defense against islamic state it's still continuing but the big resources went to there and you could not set up other things infrastructure or other things this was also big limitation so by the reactionary states regional international the, the post-war uh, makes your revolution uh, weaker. Anyway, um, the economy, one last thing about the economy is uh, uh, the, the, there's, a, there's an economy assembly where the different sectors of the economy come together. There's a trade and there are traders, small capitalists or middle big capitalists. There are, there's the industry, small industry. The agriculture, mostly there are small farmers, there are very few big farm landowners and they are not so dominant. The, and there's a, the fourth one is the cooperative sector, so the cooperatives have a role, and the women's economy. So the five sectors, they come together and take the basic decisions uh, on the economy in Rojava. So that the, there's no opportunity that one of them can uh, press its content on the others. And in general, the political structures in Rojava, they support, uh, of course, the cooperatives. And they are against, there's uh, the laws, there's a, a statement against monopolization of economy and supporting uh, solidarity economy, but, but step by step. And the revolutionaries are carefully, because uh, as I said, that many things are very new, and the Kurdish freedom movement before didn't discuss much economy. Even in North Kurdistan, we didn't discuss much economy. It's everything there is for us actually new. So uh, let's continue. Um, what I can say still on economy is that we have a lot of oil and natural gas. There's a lot, uh, but the problem was <clears throat> there was no refining in Rojava, so we had a lot of oil, but couldn't refine. So after one year, they could manage to refine it. I say because it's important. The oil, the refined oil to uh, diesel is crucial uh, because with, with diesel, you have your mobility, you, you organize your heating, complete heating is based on it. Electricity comes mainly from diesel. And now it has changed also because uh, some two, three big dams have been liberated uh, on the Euphrates River. Anyway, so uh, it's used for many things, <coughs> even and uh, but also for electricity. As I said, electricity. Why? Because the the people produce electricity mainly with uh, generators, diesel generators, in the streets of Rojava. Most streets you see hundreds, thousands of generators uh, to have electricity. And this is a big problem, health problem, and ecological problems, and so on. Anyway, so uh, as I said, we have 200 uh, cooperatives, and they develop quite well. The, the results of the last years, last two years were good. Yeah. And the cooperatives, they have done just even their first uh, Congress. Uh, the, about the public companies, I said there's a, now one, two experiments to transform public companies into cooperatives. So these are things which are just everything is new. And I spoke about the political process. First, we had the TEVDEM, the Movement for Democratic Society, the direct democratic structures. Then we have the democratic self-administration. Now we have the last months, there's development, establishment of the so-called Democratic Federation of Northern Syria. So, uh, with the uh, last two years, a lot of regions have been liberated from the Islamic State. So, more areas, territory uh, is free, 
liberated and uh, there are a lot of mainly Arabic populated regions and the Arabs have started to join the political structures, especially the defense of their territories and the Syrian democratic forces have been created three years, almost three years ago. <clears throat> so um, now then as the next step, this idea to uh, to go further was to form the Democratic Federation of, uh, of Northern Syria. The word Rojava is not used anymore because now there are different identities and Rojava is part of it. But with the people, the Arabs, or the Syriacs, they use other names for this territory. So the common name is kind of Northern Syria. The Kurds are uh, the most organized, the dominant still the say, element of it, but the others, they join step by step this structure more and more. Um, anyway, so in the last half year, there were elections of the communes, of the people's councils, um, to include more parts of the society uh, in the way, as I said, where in the people's assemblies part is elected part is uh, people of the members come from the different sectors of the society. Anyway, um, eh, let's go step back. Um, in the last uh, two, three years there was a um, liberation from the Islamic State, big areas in North Syria and uh, North East Syria. And, uh, the turning point was the defense of the city of Kobani, which became actually the Stalingrad for the Islamic states. Kali spoke about uh, Stalingrad in relation to Afrin, but we can say that uh, today we can clearly say that Kobani has become the Stalingrad of the Islamic state, which was and is still partly a big threat to the people of Syria, Iraq and Kurdistan. Uh, as a, some, as a very reactionary fascist force in this uh, territory which has been supported by Turkey, Saudi Arabia and Qatar and still partly supported uh, by Turkey. So this, uh, then the Syrian Democratic Forces, which include YPG and YPJ, as you know, uh, have worked uh, militarily close with the USA, <clears throat> with the US-led international coalition against the terror. Uh, it's called like this, and it's actually the government of the state where you live. And this military cooperation uh, leads to many discussions among different, let's say, in Rojava, uh, among uh, leftist democratic circles throughout the world, how to understand it that we uh, work militarily, not politically, with a force which actually was always supporting Turkey, which uh, aimed to oppress the Kurds and our uh, political movements. Yes, uh, the situation, the conditions have changed a lot, uh, but it is not a relation where, uh, let's say, the Syrian Democratic Forces or the revolution is very dependent from the USA. It's a uh, relation where a certain um, uh, mutual independency or relations, but I would not say that we are very dependent on the USA. You can see it um, if you look to different events in the past. And uh, the US never supported or supports uh, the political system in North Syria. There's no political support. You know that there are the so-called Geneva talks for a solution of uh, the war in Syria. For example, the U.S. never showed any third, serious effort to include the Kurds or, let's say, northern Syria. They only say we work militarily and they have their own interests to have a certain, let's say, um, a space and uh, an inf way of influencing Syria. Uh, to, to use it in their interest against Iran and so on. There's a big hegemonic struggle with Russia. Uh, we know this, but what for us is important, the self-empowering of our society, self-organization, we try to develop the stro as strong as possible, 
this is what we try to do because we know uh, the stronger we are, the strong, the better we can defend our revolution. And coming to Afri, I would say, if we, if the people of Afri, the Syrian Democratic Forces and uh, the whole uh, society there, can defend, uh, resist so much against the Turkish army and its proxies, it is because of this strong <clears throat> self-organization. I mean, a big army with the technology of the whole world, military technologies, attacking you daily, and they bomb uh, without stopping, and uh, they come with ten thousands of uh, soldiers and fighters, and they have won some territory uh, around the border, and now they try to approach to the city of Afrin, and the Kurdish side, or let's say the uh, revolutionary side of northern Syria, of Rojava, it's very clearly that they will defend it and uh, to the end they say we must defend uh, the, this revolutionary democratic project here in Afri. If we, uh, we cannot give it up, it's principally not possible and we do it for our interest. We must be very strong and the Turkish state must be uh, have it very difficult there and losses and only through this a strong resistance uh, we can create contradictions between Turkey and the other regional or the international powers and we can bring it to the international agenda and uh, make public a pressure on Turkey. Herein the solidarity of people all around the world like you, I would like to mention it, uh, is important uh, the struggle in Afrin is very crucial. If we can defend Afrin, we can defend the revolution of Rojava, we can defend the democratic perspective of Syria, we can defend the democratic perspective for uh, Middle East. If uh, the revolution of Rojava is defeated, uh, it will be a backslash for the democratic revolutionary forces in Middle East for many, many years. And this and we are in a historical moment now. That's why resistance and solidarity is very important. So I would stop here and we can go to the discussion. I think I already spoke a lot. Uh, what do you think? Thank you for listening. Um, we just jump straight into questions. Folks, you have any questions? I'm curious, they talk about my to speak up so you can hear. Can you hear me? Yes, I can. I'm curious about the development of the communes and the people's assemblies. I know this is this revolution has been going on, you mentioned things going all the way back to the eighties. But I'm just very curious of the types of things that you guys did to really sort of develop people's consciousness to grow the communes and to grow the people's assemblies. So I didn't get the question. I said you said that you are curious how it develops and how it's yeah, working. Yeah, just to know. Um, I don't know if it was just the PKK or the various organizations, but I'm curious about the work that you all did to grow the communes and to grow the people's assemblies in terms of developing people's communist of uh, people's consciousness and getting them to buy in to the democratic model in your revolution. I mean. Uh, um, the communes, you must understand, in the beginning, there was um, not a big movement which requested uh, people's assemblies or communes in Rojava. It was a smaller part of the society. Actually, PYD discussed it. And let's say the people close to PYD, for them it was a big a subject. And uh, when the space was opened with the war in Syria, they set it up step by step. Uh, it took a while uh, that the that the bigger part of the society, um, let's say, uh, acknowledged it or considered it as important. In the beginning, it was more like a structure where we organize ourselves on local level so that the social order uh, is maintained. There is no big uh, big, how to say, big uh, chaos or an economic 
problematic situation uh, or economic crisis. Um, but with time, uh, especially with discussions and uh, seminars, education, uh, this issue became better discussed, better uh, argumented how it should work. It, uh, in the last six years, seven years, it, it underwent a lot of changes, of course. Um, but I was just one year ago in Rojava and I went to many of the communes and jo joined them, their meetings. Um, there are communes which work quite well. That means uh, they organize uh, 70 or uh, 80 percent of the households join the regular meetings. Let's say the General Assembly, which meets every month. And they have a kind of coordination of the co chairs and the co speakers persons of the committees. Um, some work quite well, and they are successful in organizing their environment in many ways. Uh, some are weaker, uh, maybe only 30% join it. That doesn't mean that the others do not recognize it, but uh, the active participation is important. What the commune does, I mentioned the co uh, committees, the communes, uh, on the one side they organize the basic life, the needs, try to meet the economic social needs of the people. On the other side it's a political structure, where people do political work, educational work, and organize the participation to the different other structures, to the defense of the revolution, to the spread of the revolution. Uh, for example, economically, they uh, buy things together, so it's becoming cheaper. You must consider the war economy. Uh, they organize the heating together, uh, for example, the commune buys one or two diesel generators if they're for electricity, they do it together. They clean their streets by themselves. There are kind, there are kind of municipalities, which is a kind of administration, but they uh, take the decisions on shops in their streets. They t take decisions, um, as I said, they have a peace commission, they solve the uh, they try to solve the conflicts in their environment, and uh, they yes, and um, as I said, the healthcare tries to be developed. They have a kind of self-defense structure. I mean, apart from YPG or YPJ, and the general security forces, they are not police. They are not called police, and they are called Asayish. Asayish means extra security. And they have a special own defense structures in each commune. So in each area they try to, uh, how do you say, to organize themselves. Of course there's a, always a challenge that some people, some circles in a commune try to, uh, how do you say, to become dominant, to uh, become a strong force or use it for their own interests. There's always this ongoing struggle, of course. There are, the society was organized very hierarchical or patriarchal until now. It's now changing. And this uh, influence is always present, of course. But uh, you have some mechanisms like the women's participation. So in the commune, there are, of, of course, women's. Uh, in the Coordination, there are always, wherever there's a meeting, kind of meeting, they have not only one, two women, you have an important part are women, 40% at least. Um, maybe not always in the general assemblies, but in the structures, in the most other structures. Anyway, you have a women committee often, and you have a youth committee, and they are struck, important structures which fight always against patriarchal, hierarchical structures. And there are educational activities. I um, mean, uh, people from the academies come, the people go to the economies, there's a kind of system. And this is an important mechanism to, to act against hierarchical uh, developments, uh, clientele developments in a commune. Um, 
there's always an ongoing big, uh, um, how do you say, a discussion or struggle inside the communes, of course. I don't want to idealize uh, the structures. There are still some areas in Rojava, a few areas or streets where are no communes. There are very some cities you can find them, this case. But in Afrin or Kobani, uh, you have a 100% coverage of communes. And you see the power with time. Uh, uh, the people understand with time, that's what they said last year. They said not too much in the beginning, but with time we understood how we can defend, uh, organize our life better and uh, defend our interests in the broader structure uh, better and how we can have a more sharing among the commune. So we took care through our economy committee that nobody has hunger. Uh, that this family, which with almost no means, get some support, or we create co cooperatives. Some communes they took the, this the initiative to uh, cities to form cooperatives by their own, and in the cooperatives, women work or other people, and the land cooperatives, uh, the poorest people work. We have a, a kind of how do you say? including people in the economical structures, uh, development. This uh, everything happens uh, through, especially through the communes. I hope to, to met uh, the question of your, the, your question. Yes, thank you. I've got one. I want to thank you for taking some time to, to speak to us. Can you hear me? Yes. OK. <clears throat> Could you talk about the ideological differences between the Kurdistan Workers' Party and the democratic confederalism that's going on now? Yes. Ha. To speak more about this. Yes. Could you speak about the differences between the Kurdistan Workers' Party, the ideological differences, and the democratic confederalism that's happening now? I mean, uh, democratic confederalism has been developed by Erjalan, which is who is the leader of PKK and by PKK itself. <clears throat> and there is no, uh, con I would not say there's a contradiction. Actually, the idea of democratic confederalism came from Kurdish freedom movement. Uh, in its center is the PKK, the Kurdistan Workers Party, and Erjalan. So it is a project of which comes from the uh, Kurdish freedom movement with the PKK. I didn't so you, get your. You wouldn't say there were any major ideological differences between the Kurdistan Workers Party and what's going on now. No. The, you mean um, PYD is a party of uh, Syrian Kurds, and uh, it is it has approved very early. Said it has said we uh, take democratic confederalism as our ideological basis. And I must consider that Erdogan lived long year in Syria and Rojava, so PYD and PYD are people which have been former years uh, organized by PKK in the 80s and 90s, <coughs> and uh, have been affected by PKK. And there are also members who were before in PKK in the 80s and 90s. And then it has been founded in 2003 and then joined the PYD in 2000, maybe three, four, five, or especially after 2011, when the uh, revolution process started, many Syrian Kurds left PKK to join the revolutionary struggle there. I don't see any ideological differences uh, of democratic confederalism for North Kurdistan and Rojava. Thank you. I mean, I think it's, that's, that's the main thing. If I'm understanding from my study, that it's the group that's, to, that's in Iraq in particular where there is some difference. Is that, is that correct? Is, is that you had spoken to it earlier about there just being some differences with some of the forces in Iraq primarily? Uh, politically and, ide and ideologically? Yes, uh, I mentioned that uh, in Iraqi Kurdistan there are two big Kurdish parties which rule the, uh, the, uh, the federal, uh, the regional government of Iraqi Kurdistan. 
these are the Kurdish Democratic Party and the Patriotic Union of Kurdistan. One's leader is Barzani, the president of Iraqi Kurdistan. And uh, they, are, they are older parties than PKK. They became strong very early in the 70s. And uh, they fought against Saddam Hussein. And then they got the autonomy in Iraqi Kurdistan. Especially after 2003, with the U.S. Uh, occupation of Iraq, they got their autonomy and official. And uh, then a lot of money came to Iraqi Kurdistan. And they they actually wanted the kind of development like in Dubai, a full neoliberal capitalist society, a clientele society. The, the economic, uh, let's say the bourgeoisie, is in the hand of the two parties. It's not uh, something different. And this is a difference, let's say, to the Western states. The bourgeoisie is more or less often uh, the political power in the states of the Middle East, mostly. Um, yes, and they, especially the Kurdistan Democratic Party, the P KDP from Barzani, is against uh, the idea of democratic confederalism, against the uh, Kurdish freedom movement, the leftist democratic uh, Kurdish political movement. And uh, not just since 2005, already in the 80s, there were disputes, contradictions, uh, conflicts. In the 90s, 92, the fighters of the two big Iraqi Kurdish parties, they joined the military operation of the Turkish army against the PKK. In the 90s, there were directly wars, but they stopped after 2000. But the ideological discrepancies uh, continued. The PKK has a lot of thousands of fighters in the mountains of Iraqi Kurdistan, the higher mountains. They are there for many, many years. And there's a, let's say, in Kurdistan, there are two big blocks, ideological blocks. One is the Kurdish Freedom Movement with PKK and PYD, including the Rojava Revolution. On the other side, you have uh, the, the more, let's say, the right, the conservative neoliberal bloc, the hierarchical, patriarchal bloc, which is represented mainly by Barzani's party, Kurdistan Democratic Party. There are also other parties, of course, in the middle and so on, but these are the two main blocs for all parts of Kurdistan. And the right bloc, they, <clears throat> they're connected to the USA, but not only USA, it's connected to Turkey, to Iran a little. So they, they try to uh, have a Let's say they have a political structure which deals with all the reactionary forces and they limit each kind of, uh, they have limited democracy in Iraqi Kurdistan and not against the only Kurdish freedom, but against all other parties. There's always a repression and the democratic space is very limited. It's maybe better than in Baghdad or so, but it's still very limited, especially for the people from the Kurdish freedom movement. And they were even, as I said, they have had an embargo on Iraqi on Rojava. It's in the last months that it has become a little weaker, but <clears throat> they have an embargo. Imagine, on the one side you have an autonomy, and the others on the other part of Kurdistan, the Kurds form also a democratic autonomy, but uh, you do a embargo, and you say that's not a revolution. And uh, you want, as you Barzani uh, said to, to, to the Rojava revolution, if you give up, if you give 50% of the power to me or the, to the parties which are linked to me, uh, to, uh, then I will, there, there will be no embargo anymore and we can have good economic relations. This is what Barzani tried to negotiate in the years before. In the beginning of the revolution, and uh, this is what he done uh, has done. So um, there's a big fight, and uh, but the right block over the years has become weaker with time, especially after the referendum case in last October. Remember, in Iraq, for there was a referendum to be an own state, and then there was attack by the Iraqi army, support by Turkey and Iran. So, especially in the last months, this option has become weaker. And let's say the revolutionary bloc, if you look to all the Kurds or all of Kurdistan, it's uh, 
size of numbers, much bigger. Uh, in terms of a political project, it's much more stronger, uh, but it's oppressed. It's oppressed because it's an independent movement. It, it, it doesn't uh, allow any power, international or regional, to become dominant over the movement. Of course, there are relations always, there have been relations, and at least we must have them. But the issue is to, to, to remain independent. Thank you for that. Anybody else got any questions? I got one. Uh, what's, what's the um, current relationship like between the um, Kurdish freedom movements, the defense units, and, and Assad's forces? Um, I mean, there have been, after the liberation in 2012, there have been never any strong fights or wars between them. Uh, from time to time, there have been some clashes here or there, but very temporarily or uh, localized. And there were and are, of course, always relations. There were always negotiations, but it is uh, never so that um, there is a strong uh, cooperation and a cooperation sense of like the, the Kurdish side, especially the Rojava revolution, um, supports the Ba'ath regime or so. This was claimed by many different forces, states, powers, especially within Syria or the ones which are hostile to the Rojava revolution again and again. They say actually Rojava re revolution works together with the Assad regime. It was not the case. Uh, the Assad regime never had, since the uh, liberation, the power to attack it. Uh, they could have attacked it and could have damaged in a certain point level the revolution, revolution of Rojava, but this would have been their own end. I mean, because they were actually the, the big fight was against other factions, and Nusra and the FSA groups and the other reactionary groups and also Islamic State. Anyway, so uh, this is a relation of uh, mutual interest. There is no political basis, uh, but uh, it was all over the years like this. In the last one year there were negotiations um, which were moderated by Russia about a, a way to find a way how they how, um, how do you say about the political uh, status of Syria in general, especially of northern Syria? And um, let's say the northern Syria side, the revolutionary side, wanted this uh, strong autonomy, of course. They didn't want to give up much to this uh, power, central power in Damascus. And they wanted also to change, democratic change of the whole state. They always said we are a part of Syria, but of a democratic Syria. So Syria must be democratized and we will be part of it. The Syrian state regime was never uh, at the point where they agreed on, a, let's say, certain democratization of the state. They accepted a certain autonomy, uh, local autonomy for the Kurds but very to a certain point. We don't know actually really what was the real content of the negotiation. This is only what we hear from here and then. Some Kurds who joined it gave some statements, but we don't know the details. But I think that in the beginning, the Ba'ath regime said, as if one and a half, two years ago, they said, okay, you will get more cultural rights. You can have your mother tongue here in education. Uh, we will give uh, stronger, more rights to the municipalities. This was the approach of the Syrian state one, one and a half year ago. In the last month, they said, the Basque regime said, actually, if you give up the Raqqa region and the uh, Minbij and De Rezor, the many Arabic regions to us, give the control to us, and then you can have for Rajava uh, autonomy, a good autonomy, almost like in in uh, Iraqi Kurdistan. So they wanted that the revolutionary makes, gives up half of the territory. 
and, but this was of course not accepted. The, the new political structure is, as I said, the Democratic Federation of Northern Syria, and they say we want a fed democratic federation uh, for all of Syria, and the north and part, and the liberated parts, we want a strong uh, autonomy or a federation, federative structure. So the negotiations were ongoing in the last months, and uh, Russia and the Ba'ath regime, they made pressure on the on North Syria to uh, accept it. They always said, if you don't accept, then Turkey will attack you. And uh, we cannot stop Turkey because uh, they want to attack you. And I can only stop it if you have an agreement with the Ba'ath regime. Of course, they played with this. They used it as a leverage against the revolutionary project. And they did it even in the weeks before the Afrin uh, occupation started by the Turkish state. They did it until to the last moment. They said, okay, at least Afrin should come under the uh, rule of the Ba'ath regime, except that you will get some autonomy, of course, but except that the Ba'ath military comes back and uh, there's, uh, you have some of your rights, but not too much, and it's a part of Syria again. If we, this was not accepted because they have developed such a strong autonomy, uh, a strong society, the communes, the assemblies, uh, different structures, more, much more democratic, of course, and uh, where the, the different identities have space, where the women are very strong. They didn't want to give up this. They said they accepted a, to, certain, to a certain point the Syrian state, but what the Syrian state wanted was much more. So now uh, these negotiations they failed. That's why Russia said to Turkey, now there are also, of course, other interests for Russia, other global interests, other economic interests. They allow Turkey to attack Afrin also from air. So the, this is a situation and the relations Short in relation with, uh, between the revolutionary project and the Ba'ath regime, is, uh, there are relations, negotiations, but there are always there are big tensions, and there's not a war. Tensions, negotiations, it can go always in both directions. Ba'ath, wow. Ba'ath, wow. Ba'ath party. B. You'd be A A T H. Yeah, sorry, yes, yes. Ba'ath regime. It's a Syrian regime, yes. Uh, the Ba'athist party is a party, I think it started in the 40s. Um, and at one point it was it was technically the, the party that was governing both uh, Syria and Iraq. Um, and um, it was part of the, the, at one point, part of a project uh, to create a, a kind of a pan-African uh, Arab Republic uh, between uh, Egypt uh, 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 and Iraq that, that collapsed. Um, uh, yeah, but it's, it's, a, it's an Arab nationalist, pan-African, pan-Arabist pan party. Um, and the, the Syria uh, and, and the Assad <coughs> Uh, regime are are kind of some of its last. Uh, it's the last place where it, it, it's hold any sure. form of government power, state power, is in is in Syria right now. Federation of something in Syria. Mm -hmm. Federation of something in Syria. You said a couple times, but I didn't get the first word. But the Democratic the Federation. Federation. The Democratic Federation of, of in in northern Syria, where the Democratic Revolution, we, we one of our uh, folks came in a bit late, and I think is trying to catch up. Okay. Uh, <laughs> that too, but I'm not catching the words, uh -huh. and I think there's a word. Democratic in Federation. Oh, it's two words. Yeah. Democratic. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, but there's a phrase. You talking about Rojava? Is that is that the word? No, it's the Federation of something in Syria is what I. Thought he said, but I didn't get that first word. Love something. I think that's what I remember saying. Yeah. But it, it's it's recorded. 
Jan, so we can, uh, we can go back. Are there any any other questions, please? What do you think is the most effective way that Westerners can show solidarity? And do you think that it's useful or not useful for Westerners to directly participate in the Rojava revolution? Or is it better to work within our nation's uh, Um, there are different ways, of course, of solidarity. And one way is, of course, to go to Rojava, join the political struggle or the army struggle. Actually, several hundred or a few thousands have done it. Many have come back after a certain while and many are still there. This is a way, of course, then you can uh, just experience a revolutionary process uh, with all the contradictions but also what is created uh, uh, there in reality that uh, social revolution is possible in our time in a certain territory and to have to get the hope uh, to believe that things can change um, this is important of course but uh, in the same way maybe more not more but in the same way it's also important to, to, um, to discuss it, to read about it, to spread the information which you have, the discussions, and uh, in, especially in critical times like now to do also even actions uh, in solidarity with the revolution of Rojava, um, which is currently one of the most important in these times and democratic revolutionary struggles uh, of our time and our planet, one of the most important now, and uh, one which is in a very uh, difficult situation and surrounded by enemies, and but could survive until now six years. Uh, I mean, you must uh, consider that USA, Russia, Iran, Turkey, Saudi Arabia, I don't know, the most powers are involved there, and they could survive until now. And um, the course, or let's say, I, I'd never say um, what, uh, uh, that you can look to Rojava and try to implement it in your country. It's not, not the case, of course, so, because often people ask this. But the idea, there are the more the core ideas are here important that societies can organize themselves, can uh, find their way to. Uh, empowers themselves uh, to uh, request the state, state, especially the nation state, and uh, that uh, they can organize life in a very new way, like you are also discussing for so many years. Um, um, now, concerning Rojava, one side I said is to spread information, to do actions of solidarity, to go also to, to, of course, to the broader public, because Rojava is known, especially Kobani is known uh, in the world, especially with the resistance against Islamic State. And uh, this has a positive uh, this head and has a positive reaction in the world. Uh, the most people, they uh, are, think more positive about Kobani. And uh, this is a connection where you can connect and uh, where the do doors are open even to the mainstream press. Uh, not only the leftist democratic press, also the mainstream press or the mainstream public. Uh, the, um, this is, in terms of Rojava, you have this opportunity. And uh, in these weeks and months, it is, I think, important everybody could contribute in this way Actually, I don't say contribute, or maybe yes, but take part in the solidarity structures. Today it is uh, uh, Rojava, tomorrow it's another place, and uh, now as, as it's so urgent, it's very important that we can do what we can, what is in our capacity in the cities, regions where we live. And you, you are in the USA, the US government is uh, one of the players in the conflict of Syria, and uh, the pressure on 
I don't know how much you have means, I cannot judge it, but um, each contribution or um, let's say impact on the public opinion is important for us. Uh, the, it's also a source of motivation for the people in Rojava. They hear that people do actions all over the world. For them it's very important. Um, if you link in, lo in longer terms, is of course to study what we are doing in Rojava, on Kurdistan, what you are doing there, especially movements who have uh, so many common aspects, um, like it's in the case of Kurdistan and uh, your movement. It's very interesting to look. Uh, as I said, I read uh, one paper of you and find it very interesting and uh, I will read more and I will share it also with in Kurdish, uh, with the um, people in Rojava, North Kurdistan, uh, and the Kurds. We have opportunities to bring it to the press and people will hear about it. Uh, it's exciting for us that uh, you have uh, this uh, movement there in uh, Jackson and other parts of the US. I was going to ask, what, what, what is it about the Kurds uh, physically, geographically, or their history that would make them more vulnerable to annihilation than any other group of them? What is it about, what is it about them? Is it something physical? Is it something historical? Vulnerable would, to what? That would have made the Kurds more vulnerable to being oppression. What is it? And I'm trying to make a comparison. What is it? I, I, I get it. I don't, I don't know how to ex express it, but I know what you're getting at. Uh -huh. um, the, uh, um, well, the current. Uh -huh. the, the, Some groups the are more vulnerable. You, know, yes. you just pick on them. You know? why, why would you? Why, why, why have they? Yeah, right. OK. So let me try to answer. I mean, the Kurds. Uh, they are oppressed by four different nation states, which uh, wanted and want still to assimilate the Kurds, included in their dominant national perception. And uh, the Kurds, the territory where the Kurds live in majority, it is of economic interest. And uh, okay, many countries are like this, but. The Kurds, they had not an own say They have been defeated after the First World War, and then they had no political structures, entities on local, regional, international level which defended their rights. They had to fight uh, long wars, resistance over decades to come to this point. And no international state or power and no regional state had any interest that the Kurds get their rights. This was for a long time the case. Um, the whole system in the Middle East was developed on the approach that the Kurds are completely neglected and then assimilated, oppressed. No any certain big power, regional power has done anything for the Kurds. Only when they became now stronger after long struggles, after hundreds of thousands of people have been killed and millions have been displaced, now the, some powers show interest to, to, that the Kurds get some, let's say, administrative rights, regional, local, autonomous rights. The USA plays with this, of course, for their own uh, geostrategic interests in Middle East, but they try to instrumentalize the Kurds after they came to this point. But the other powers, not yet. And the U.S., they, it's unclear how, how much they will go. They try to play it at a certain point, but uh, we saw it in the referendum case last October in Iraqi Kurdistan. But they are also able to let fall the Kurds from their position. And this is... Uh, we are now in a position with the wars, especially after 2011 and the Middle East and the struggles, that the, the, uh, the status in Middle East is questioned. 
uh, requestion it. And for us, it's an opportunity uh, to, to get a status for the Kurds in these four states. If we can be successful in our struggles, we can get a certain status. But we must fight for it. If we not, will not fight in the redesigning of Middle East, the Kurds will be neglected again. Uh, and the Kurds, the difference from the uh, is things is the Kurds that connect their struggle. It's not only a struggle for their own national rights, cultural or political rights. They connect it to to the let's say to the democratic struggles in these four states of Turkey, Iran, Iraq, and Syria. They formed democratic coalitions like in Syria and North Syria where they have this Democratic Federation of North and Syria, where they included the others, the Syriacs, Arabs, Armenians, uh, and so on, and uh, in a certain way successfully, and to overcome this nation state on Syria. The Kurds have a certain success in Turkey. They have a, an, an, say an umbrella structure and umbrella party in Turkey, which is called HDP. And it's a coalition with different democratic and leftist revolutionary forces in Turkey. It's still existing. And they look uh, to, to coalitions, democratic coalitions, because they only fight for their alone, for their narrow rights, and not narrow, I mean national rights. They, the opportunity to be successful is very low. Uh, they do it not only because of tech, this democratic coalitions with the others, the Turks, Arabs, and so on. It's not only a tactical one, it's also justified uh, ideologically. Because we have also broken with the idea of a uh, nation state. We fight for our nation, uh, national rights, but its name is, as I said, not a new nation state and even not a new state. A strong entities, democratic, regional, uh, autonomous entities within the states to, to have more society and less state. I, I think the other piece, um, Ajahn, if, if the other piece may be, um, uh, you touched on earlier about uh, the indigenous nation of the, the the indigenous nature of the community uh, between those yeah. mountain ranges, and um, uh, I think you touched on uh, the Ottoman Caliphate and how the French and the British split that up, and and why they split it up the way that they they split it up after World War One. I. I think that may get into more of, of some of your question, like the history mm -hmm. of how these borders got created because they weren't they weren't created by the people who lived there they were created by people in Europe mm -hmm. primarily a lot of parallels can be drawn to Native American yeah, yeah. okay yeah. Mm -hmm. well I can forward to it that's just what that's what's beginning to sound like mm -hmm. and I mean if I may make an observation it's beginning to sound like the Kurds are being treated as the, as the, as the darkies in these areas using shock troops Against against these by these imperialist entities to wage wars or incursions with any sovereign states to destabilize to further destabilize it. And then once they once they have done their job, kick the targets aside and 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 re re best re enslave them or re re. I guess I can't figure the word right now. Re best re enslave them. You know, or isolate them. Yeah, that's, too, yeah, yeah, marginalized. That's, that's what I'm looking for. Yeah. And that's, that's, that's what it's getting to sound like, you know. Because I, I know at one point in time, reading, you know, uh, following the movement for a long time, you know, there was a point in particular where the British made some promises of a Kurdish state, uh, as they did all over the world to different peoples, right? Mm -hmm. you, you side with us and we'll, mm -hmm. we'll set you up with this or we'll give you a kingdom here or we'll give you a new state. Uh, some which they fulfill for their own strategic purposes, but most of them they had never had any intent or, or purposes on elevating anybody or giving them more uh, uh, 
power within the international kind of state structure. And then I think the, the other piece that I would just add is that, you know, most of these states wind up being reconstructed with the, the particularly by the British, by forces that were the old ruling class forces anyway. They just came up with new arrangements to be like, you know, we'll leave you in control, but you will have to work for us now and pay tribute to us, you know, and bow to, to us. And America basically has kind of kept most of that system intact. In any other questions? I want to let him go because it's, it's getting late okay. on, on his end. I think it's almost 10 o'clock. Any other questions? Nine, nine o'clock. Okay, nine o'clock. <laughs> could you ask him if there's anybody communicating with him by email or asking directly? Is there any way to communicate with you directly, like email or do you do Facebook or? Yes, we can communicate. Of course, it's possible. Email is a good way. Kali can give you my email to you. If you have any questions or want more information, I have a presentation on Rajava just did it, a PowerPoint presentation. I will send it to you. It's more with pictures and I can also regularly send you new papers on it. And there's also a book which I wrote with two friends on the revolution Rojava and which is one and a half years old, but describes the processes as I try to do. Thank you. Yes. I can send all this information by email, of course. <laughs> yeah, please do. Please do. Yes. So if there's no more questions, uh, I want to let the comrade go. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Um, Thank you also. Learned a lot, got more, more detail even my, myself. Kali, mm -hmm. one question. I have one question to you. Sure. Uh -huh. uh, um, how have you discussed, or if yes, how you discuss the military cooperation uh, between um, the Syrian Democratic Forces and the U.S. military? I think it's also a certain discussion point. How, for you, it must be a little difficult. Uh, no, not really. Uh, for me, as, I, I can only speak for as an individual on that question. And um, uh, to me, it's been very clear from from the beginning of the of uh, the revolution, and and I would say that the revolution and intervention that occurred in Syria, because I think, in my view, both happened at the same time. Um, that has been very clear that the United States uh, has been very much interested and led uh, and is continuing to feed a process of what we would call bleed everybody out, right? And that uh, for them, as long as Sunni is fighting Shia and Kurds are fighting uh, Arabs and, and, and Turks, uh, there is no common basis for uh, unity in the region. Uh, and it just furthers, you know, their longstanding imperialist interests of divide and conquer. And so all these moves that they make with now fight, now supporting Syria one day, being against Syria the next day, the, the, I mean the Ba'athist regime in particular, uh, supporting them one day, fighting them against the, the next, uh, these are all tactical diversions uh, uh, in, in my view. Uh, and I think the long range thing is to keep a mind, keep an eye on what the United States is trying to do in the global game, uh, which on a certain level, really, they don't give a damn about Arab, Syrian, it, they really could care less. Uh, uh, and it's more about, I think, this uh, contest in many respects from the U.S. side is how do they retain power a little bit longer? Uh, or reconsolidate their power, uh, particularly to kind of counter the, the the rise of of China in the in the switch in the hegemonic order between imperialist states, which I see China as also being. Um, so, uh, to me, this is one of like several theaters that they will move and operate in, and I don't. I think it always, from my vantage point, it's. If you're going to look at it on the macro level, uh, it's always mindful to understand what their aims and ob objectives are, 
because they will use us, you know, be it be it Kurds or or black people, or they'll use us to move a little piece on the chessboard and then di totally discard us the next. And I think we have to always keep a, keep an eye on what are the people's interests, what is the working class interest, which is different than a state interest, be it Syria, be it the United States, or any one of these states. So that that's my own personal view on this. So them siding now. Uh, uh, with Bashar, you know, that's just another tactic, you know, and, and they'll do it for a minute. And as soon as it doesn't suit their purpose, they'll go back to, you know, demanding regime change or, you know, having the Saudis or Israelis, you know, launch some new attacks, or they can do both at the same time, which we've seen them do, you know, over the past six years, where uh, uh, the FBI supporting one group and the CIA supporting another group and the State Department it's supporting another group, um, you know, for them, as long as folks are, as long as the conflict keeps going, as long as the bleeding keeps happening, as long as people are being further and further divided, it, it furthers their objective. So to me, I think the question really is, and, and why I think your presentation and all this was so important, um, um, you know, for me, I want to get into a deeper understanding, which I think is only going to come in, come through practice and, and studying what you all are doing closely, as closely as I can, you know, um, how the situation is going to continue the actual revolution in Syria, which I see it doing. And I think the position that you were taking and that you explained uh, in the negotiations, uh, I hope people, the way I read it, when you're saying that uh, um, the forces in, in northern Syria would not surrender any territory, you know, uh, uh, to the Ba'athist regime. I hope people don't take that to be a pragmatic decision because that's not how I read it. How I read it is if you were to give up that territory, you're actually resubjecting the people in that region to an oppressive force and not extending the actual revolution. So uh, um, uh, I think it's beyond just a pragmatic question. And I thought that that was that when I heard that and studied that, I remember I was in some debate, and that's the that's the, the way I was trying to articulate it. It's like it's not this can't be a quid pro quo, you know. You support me, and I give up some territory, you know, because it's it's very clear that even to me at least, uh, you know, Bashar is not fighting the movement in in northern Syria right now, but that doesn't mean that he doesn't intend to at some point. Yes. This can happen. Yeah. <laughs> okay, thank you for your statement. Yeah. Uh, there may be another question. So, what, what? Uh, just what is Bashar's aim at this point? Hold power. power. Uh, huh? Hold <laughs> power as long as he can. Okay. So, basically, he's, he's, he's just trying to stay on the throne. Basically. I mean, that's my read on it. Yeah, he's just basically. Now, because I'm wondering, with all this going on, all the turmoil and all these, all these different players on the chessboard, but with, 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 with his long game and his end game is going to play, you know, he's trying to be, but so with Russia back in him, right, what, what, um, they're getting it for the same reasons the United States they want, want the resources on the soil, right? They want control the resources down there. They want, they want to get their hands on that oil. <laughs> well, I think for them, it's not just, they, for the Russians, I think is is that, but I think they also, as a sub-imperialist power, right. they can't lose vital territory on the chessboard. Mm -hmm. Okay. Right? Because right. you know the United States controls far more. You look at the yeah. United States controls far more of the, the chessboard, and like right. what's going on in, in Latin America, right. they will even, you know, at this stage of the game. Well, it's like, okay, for a minute, I'll tolerate Brazil trying something new. I'll tolerate Venezuela trying something new because, you know, Colombia, Guyana, and everything else around it is still under my control. Right. And if it can't grow, you know, and if it doesn't break out, if it doesn't change relations within its own society, and if it doesn't change relations in the international society, if I can box you in, you know, I can come back around to you when right. the conditions are more favorable. And I think that's what's happening in Venezuela, mm -hmm. right? Because it's not like the United States ever changed its objective around Venezuela mm -hmm. from 1998 to now. Mm -hmm. It's just that for a brief period of time, maybe seven or eight years, you know, Venezuela had a few allies, 
you know, in Argentina, in, in Brazil, uh, 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 in Ecuador, and in, and in uh, Bolivia, right. right? But none of them really, in my view, able, was able to go beyond the, the kind of bourgeois democratic, you know, uh, um, exercise of power to transform the society. And then, and then you see in Brazil, they turn, they turn that on its head right. and use the structure to execute a, a, a parliamentary coup right. um, and then con confer the isolate. So, I mean, like, they have far more resources to play a long game, right. you know, than, than we do, uh, uh, you know, which is why it's so important when we do get opportunities to try to get them as right as we can get them right uh, and to reach as many people as we can reach. Um, you know, because we don't have the same resources, we don't have the same reach, we don't have the media to propagate lies and misinformation. We don't, we don't have that that, that shapes public opinion in the same way. And I, but I think for Russia, and I'm not defending Russia. I ain't no Russia defender. But I think for them, having control of a, of that port is is very important. You know, uh, because if you look at it on a certain extent, Russia is kind of landlocked at least to the west. Outside of the the, was the Black Sea, yeah, and that means that their only real access seawise outside of the frozen North is far, far to the east, where they where they're not that industrially developed, wow. and it's right in like China and Japan's back door, which has historically been a problem for them. Yeah. yeah. So I think they they have to they they play in it like I need access to the world, you know, and so I don't think to a certain extent they had a long-standing relationship with the Baathist regime. But historically, the Russians or the Soviets, they would play the boss off one day and and you you know betray him one day and and you know befriend him the next. They did kind of the same you know uh, basic thing. And then if you go back to the Soviet days, you know the Soviet Union basically sat there and watched uh, for a period of time the Baathist regime annihilate the communist parties in Iraq and and, and Syria and some of the other left forces. And they just kind of turned a blind eye to it for for a long period of time. Um, so I think, you know, it's it's a it's a game for both of them, you know. Uh, but I don't think we, sh you know, Russia is an imperialist power in my view, but I wouldn't elevate it to the same global positioning as the United States. I think the two dominant forces right now are definitely China and the United States, and it's like, who's going who's going to rule the roost? Right. But even if China takes over, the system is not going to change. Right. That's the thing I think that we need to be mm -hmm. mindful of. And folks like, well, we should side with Russia, we should side with China. I'm like, why? No, that, that's not going to help you know, us you know, at all, either way. If the system don't change, he's like, right. you know, the prelates is the prelates yeah. is the prelates. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Anything else you want to add? Any other? The questions for us or anything? No, no, I okay. think it's enough. It was great to speak to you. Likewise, Thank likewise. You. Yes. And uh, just one last thing, Quincy and everybody uh, says hello. Um, uh, we're going to be seeing each other again uh, next month for for uh, some of the Eco Socialist Internationalist work uh, that we're trying to advance here. So stay tuned for that. Oh, great. Say also hello to him. From me. Will do. Will do. Okay. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all. Yeah. <laughs>